sometimes higher alcohols, sometimes cobalt-based catalysts, sometimes methanol synthesis. Because of the great uh, uh, variety of topics that were covered in the papers that were submitted, you will find that there is some overlap between the sessions and maybe some dilution of the theme, but to the extent possible, we tried to do that. My name is Enrique Iglesia. I helped to organize this with Rocco Fiato from Action Research and Engineering, who is busy having a baby and cannot be here. So uh, he sends his regards to everyone, but he will not be here. Stu Solid from Exxon will take any duties or all duties associated with uh, Rocco's core organization from now on. He will share the last session that Rocco was supposed to share. He will also share the first session uh, today. Um, before I let him have the, the meeting for the rest of the morning, I just wanted to thank Exxon Research and Engineering for their financial support who made the coffee over there possible and who cover other minor expenses associated with the symposium. So, through. Okay, thanks very much. I'm, I'm used to being told at work how expensive it is to do research, but that's nothing compared to the cost of coffee around here. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, welcome to the session on uh, uh, fission tropes catalysis over iron, uh, iron based catalysts. We have an interesting program this morning, and I just want to impress on the speakers that they should smile because they're all being photographed when they're giving their presentations for posterity. So 30 years from now, when they look back at this, they'll uh, they want to look their best. So I think we're ready to, to get started. Um, and uh, the uh, first presentation for today is a contribution from the uh, Center for Applied Energy Research. Uh, and the authors are Bao, Yu, Shai, and Bert Davis. Bert Davis will present the presentation. Uh, the title is uh, Carbon-14 Tracer Studies of the Fischer Troll Synthesis. Are you ready, Bert? Well, when you're get to start off, you don't have to worry about anyone having shown any of your slides to that point. Uh, what I would like to do is to present some data using carbon-14 tracer studies. Uh, this is just to illustrate the use of the tracer studies. If you have the CO hydrogen forming C1 species, going through the polymerization on the surface to C2, C3, and higher molecular weight compounds. Uh, if you pick some suspected intermediate that will be formed in the synthesis, label it, in this case, with carbon-14. Let it absorb on the surface. If it is involved in the mechanism, then it will continue through the synthesis just the same as the C2 species, in this case, that's formed from the synthesis gas. And so this is the technique that we have used in going through tracers. Uh, this was done initially by Professor Paul Emmett, and he made good use of this. This is just an example of some data of his. Just concentrate on the two curves, the n-propanol ethanol. When he adds these with carbon-14, the activity of higher carbon number compounds is essentially the same as, in this case, ethanol, this case, propanol. He concluded, therefore, that the propanol absorbed, it provided a C3 species that initiated chain growth, but did not participate in it. And so, therefore, the C3 species that formed from alcohol would undergo fischer tropsch synthesis just as uh, the CO derived C3 species, but only serve to initiate. Now, since uh, the time of Professor Emmett, there have been several major advances. I just put two that applies in our case. Uh, one is in analysis. Uh, now it's possible to hook a proportional counter to the, uh, collect the effluent from a gas chromatograph so that you can now determine the activity in the species as they elute from a GC. So this greatly simplifies the analysis. 
This is just illustrating a hypothetical uh, trace of GC. Uh, you get peaks. The proportional counter will only give you a peak for those materials which contain carbon-14. So in this case, the first one doesn't contain carbon-14, no peak. Then the next one does. We can take the ratio of the area of these two and get the relative activity. Uh, if we calibrate the instrument, we can even get the specific activity of each of the compounds that we're able to separate by gas chromatography. So this greatly simplifies the analysis. Another is the use of a continuous third tank reactor. In the case of a fl plug flow reactor, you have change in concentration down the reactor so that you have the potential for many secondary reactions. At least with this reactor, we're now operating at constant conversion. And so uh, we have eliminated some of the interference of secondary reactions at least. Uh, this I'm not going to emphasize, but we're using a continuous third tank reactor. Schematic, we would put the carbon-14 compound in after we have established steady state. Uh, the CO hydrogen, uh, the conversion takes place then at constant CO conversion. We collect the products and then go through the analysis. Now, one of the things that we did early that caused us to be confused, to say the least, was illustrated here with uh, adding pentanol in which the carbon-14 is in this position. We always got the CO2 to have more carbon-14 in it than the CO. Uh, if you think of how you could have the alcohol uh, provide radioactive uh, CO, the thing that you immediately think of is hydroformylation. So that if you have CO and an olefin, you can form the aldehyde, which you can reduce to the alcohol. If this is a reversible reaction, then you should form CO. The CO would undergo the water gas shift, and this would be the way that you would get carbon-14 into the CO10. But if you do that, you can't get CO2 that has a higher radioactivity than the CO. And so how we were forming the CO2 was a puzzle. The best we could do is to say that some of the oxygen on the surface is forming something that I have illustrated here uh, as a carboxyl group. It may be, it may not be but that then this loses CO2. Uh, now, if that is the case, if we uh, look at the uh, pentanol when it's labeled in the terminal position, we should get radioactive CO2. If we make this alcohol, where the carbon-14 is in uh, the beta position rather than the position that contains the alcohol, same mechanism, then we should get carbon-14 in the C5, but not in the CO10. And when we did this conversion, we see that we do get activity in C5. The CO2 doesn't have activity. Uh, it's also puzzling why the C5 alkane has higher activity than the olefin. Uh, this suggests that the C5 alkane is being formed directly from the decomposition of this, what I had drawn as a carboxylate group. The olefin is not being formed through this scheme to a significant amount and has low activity. Another puzzling aspect is that if you label an iso alcohol, isopropanol in this case. The uh, C3 or the C4 iso paraffin has higher activity than the, the normal. The same thing for C5. So that the iso alcohol is forming iso product selectively. Remembering that this was the iso structure, if we look at the normal we see if we look at the NC4 product, the 
someplace, ISO C4, normal C4, ISO C5, normal C5, ISO C6, normal C6. Normal alcohol is making normal alkanes predominant. So that the two alcohols, ISO and normal propanol, do not become equivalent and do not form equivalent structures on the surface. This is just shown here on the parity plot, showing that if we start with the iso alcohol, and I have included some of Emmett's data in here also, iso makes iso products. Normal makes predominantly normal products. And so uh, on the surface, we then, uh, well, if you get it right, it's easier to, that uh, the iso and normal do not go to a common intermediate. Each one of these initiates a chain that remains independent on the surface. This would preclude the loss of OH to form a C3 species, which could isomerize by the old twig mechanism where an adsorbed alkyl group uh, exchanges deuterium this way, for example, where uh, you have the uh, adsorption site uh, being mobile in the C3 unit. If this C3 unit is formed, then this isomerization is precluded. Now, we've had the data for some time, but uh, it didn't seem to be explainable, and so we quit trying to explain it. I, I think that uh, it now becomes consistent with some of the work we've gotten with CO2. The water gas shift reaction has CO reacting with water to form CO2 and hydrogen. This reaction occurs very effectively over an iron catalyst, and that's the major advantage of, a major advantage of an iron catalyst. But if you're in a university, you're supposed to think about something once in a while other than developing a process and so you could envision forming CO2 without a water gas shift reaction. If, for example, CO were to dissociate on the surface to absorb carbon, absorb oxygen, you could visualize the CO either in the gas phase or absorbed, combining with this absorbed oxygen and forming directly CO2 so that it would not have to go through the water gas shift reaction. Overall, chemical balance is identical in both cases. In this case, you just don't use up water and you don't form hydrogen when you make CO10. So that we added carbon-14 labeled CO2 in a small chemical amount, less than a half of a mole percent carbon-14 labeled CO2 in the feed gas. So that if we pass the unlabeled CO, labeled car uh, carbon dioxide, if water gas shift occurs, then the CO2 should convert to CO, and we should start seeing carbon-14 labeled CO. And so we did that. And the result that we got seems quite surprising to us and uh, somewhat different than what you normally think of when you think of fischer trope synthesis. Let me go through this and start first this is the activity of the CO. This is the activity of the CO2 coming out of the CSTR at the conversion that we were operating, 60% conversion of CO. Now, if CO initiates hydrocarbon chains and CO adds to cause the chains to grow, each time you increase by one, then you will increase the activity that much. So that the C2, if that is the case, will have double the activity of C1. And so if CO is the only thing that initiates chain growth and causes chain growth, the maximum activity that the higher carbons can have, higher hydrocarbons can have, is shown by that line. If, on the other hand, CO2 could initiate and cause chain growth, it would be that. A third possibility would be that CO2 initiates and then CO causes chain growth. 
If CO initiates, then C1 has to have the same activity as the CO2. Uh, the, this line and this line must be parallel since then uh, the CO would be the way that you increase the activity. Now, if you look at the experimental data, and we have done this using two gas chromatographic techniques. The one in circles uses a gas analyzer. Uh, the one in triangle, and I'm not trying to de-emphasize the other GC by showing the data in much smaller uh, points than with the circles. It's just that you have to use the size you have, and I'd run out of the small circles. Um, this was determined using a different column that we're able to separate by carbon number up through to C9. Now, the data shows that CO is not the only source of initiating chain growth. In fact, and this line is just drawn by I through the data from C9. If we calculate the activity in C1, we calculate that approximately 53% of the CO2 that is converted initiates chains. The other 47 goes to CO. So that CO2 is functioning to initiate chain growth, and about half of the CO or CO2 that is converted forms an intermediate that initiates chain growth. This line has been drawn to be parallel with that, and I think it fits rather well that once the chain is initiated by this intermediate that's formed from CO2, then the chain growth continues by carbon from carbon monoxide. Now, this was obtained with a catalyst that has iron, potassium, and copper. And so immediately someone is going to say, well, everyone knows copper is a good methanol synthesis catalyst. And so it has nothing to do with fischer croaks catalyst. It's really the copper that is doing this. Um, but and the good thing about having young students is that they know about computers and so they make prettier pictures. This is just to show some intermediate that is formed both from CO and CO2. Uh, the thing that you might suspect here is something that resembles a formate ion, but that's speculation. But that this intermediate can then give you CO2 and CO, and that this is the water gas shift. The mechanism that we're proposing is that on the iron catalyst, the intermediate in this water gas shift reaction is the intermediate that initiates, if not all, a significant fraction of the chain that is the hydrocarbon chains formed in FTS over the iron catalyst. And furthermore, the activity is consistent with the intermediate in the water gas shift being what initiates, but then the carbon comes from the CO that continues the chain growth of the chain. <clears throat> so that we have initiation, the carbon form that is the initiation of most, if not all, the chains is different from the carbon that propagates the chain. What propagates the chain comes from the CO primarily. The initiation comes both from CO and CO2 and is the intermediate that is formed from the water gas shift. <clears throat> so to get around the ones who say that, uh, well, it's due to methanol, we ran this uh, catalyst which does not contain methanol. It has half a percent potassium, 4.4 atomic ratio of silica to iron. The activity of CO does have some activity. The CO2 is higher. But again, the activity of the hydrocarbons, and we haven't analyzed the liquids yet, uh, it would be nicer if the data were 
better to a straight line, but uh, even with that, I think you will agree that the activity of C1, C2, all of these, is higher than what you can have if it is formed from CO. You can't get this activity of C2 by forming it from 2CO. It can only double, so the activity would be here. The data without copper is therefore consistent with what we got with copper. For the real purest, then, we go to a catalyst that doesn't contain anything but iron oxide. Now, this is less active for the water gas shift, so that now the CO2 has undergone very little of the water gas shift reaction. The activity of the CO, the difference in activity between CO and CO2 is much greater. But still, the activity of C2 is at least 10 times that what it could be if it's formed from two CO's. And so again, we are to the conclusion that the water gas shift reaction forms an intermediate that initiates chain growth. And that it is not due to the presence of copper. Now, if you think long enough, you can <coughs> come up with an analogy between almost anything. And so, if what we're saying is true, then uh, the surface of this iron catalyst apparently has a much higher concentration of oxygen than what most people have thought in the past. That oxygen has been viewed to be very reactive. It combines with hydrogen to form water immediately. Uh, apparently, the oxygen concentration is high enough that we are able to form something that I have drawn here as an adsorbed carboxylate. This will then decompose to give you the hydrocarbon fragment plus CO2. If we look at one structure that we could form in the water gas shift would be something that I have drawn here as the formate ion. This is by analogy the same as the alcohol that we were starting with. This species can do two things. It can convert the CO to CO2. It also, we believe, is responsible for initiating chain growth. The growth itself occurs with carbon in CO, but the chain initiation is from the water gas shift intermediate. Now, the final is that uh, we, we have done this with ruthenium. CO2 does not convert on ruthenium to CO, nor does CO2 give us enough activity in the hydrocarbons to be able to measure it. And so CO2 with this ruthenium catalyst was essentially in an inert gas. And so this implies to us that the reaction mechanism for ruthenium and perhaps for cobalt, but we haven't run cobalt yet, so we can't say that, is different than the mechanism on iron. That there is not one common mechanism of fissure tropes. That with iron, the water gas shift intermediate is what initiates chain growth and then it is propagated by the carbon from CO. On ruthenium, the oxygen, once it gets to CO2, is inert. And with that, I will stop. Thank you, Bert. We have time for some questions. Well, could you clarify what your reaction is? The reaction condition was um, seven atmosphere gauge, 270 degrees centigrade. The gas flow was, except for the ultrafine, was 2.4 or 3.4 normal liters per hour per gram of iron. The Hydrogen to CO ratio was 0.67. The hydrogen to CO ratio in the exit gas was 1. <laughs>
so that water gas shift is obviously occurring even in the catalyst that doesn't have the alkali. It's just the extent to which it occurs. Yes? Um, how much CO2? You said you had a small amount of CO2 that you added. How much CO2 was actually added? It was about 0.2 mole percent of yeah. the CO. Okay. Um, what, what you treat as evidence of methanol not being involved could be interpreted as evidence that methanol is involved. And the first question is, is methanol, if you add methanol that's labeled to the system, do you get chain initiation exclusively to that methanol? Uh, well, I, I didn't do it yet, but Emmett did it. Okay, and what did you find? Um, he found that methanol decomposes rapidly under this CO. And so when he does this, he gets the linear increase in activity. Uh, it's not the slope of one that you would expect it, it decomposed immediately. But uh, you get a more rapid increase than what we got. And so I don't think it's going to methanol. OK. Um, the, the same formate intermediate that is involved in the water gas shift it's also an intermediate that has been involved in methanol synthesis. Yes. Now, in that sense, I am not sure how you could exclude the possibility that you're generating and immediately consuming some methanol. When I look at your uh, ultrafine iron oxide catalyst, it does look like the extent of that CO2 incorporation is lower, or initiation is lower than it was in the other yes. catalyst. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Um, the the and we're going to run methanol, but uh, the work of Emmett would suggest that methanol decomposes to give you the synthesis gas to a much greater extent than it initiated. I, I, and I say, uh, his was in a plug flow reactor, uh, and so that washes out a lot of the early part of the reaction. And the CSTR is much more ideal and suited to look at this, uh, and we will. Because when, when we added methanol to cobalt based catalysts, at least, we found that it was mostly an initiator, and it did initiate quite a bit before it actually decomposed the CO2. Well, CO2, uh, the roofing is just inert. But we're going to look at both formic acid and uh, methanol. Yeah. You mentioned <coughs> uh, there's not one common mechanism uh, which turns out from your investigations. That's of course nice. Uh, my understanding is if one takes the flory kinetics, basically, yes. as a very specific thing for Fischer Tropsch, this is in common for all the catalysts. But the secondary reactions, if you add something to the system, this is very much different depending on the catalyst matter and also on the conditions, yes? It shifts very much with the conditions. And then so far, so these added things, yes, uh, you can get much information from that. It's of course very true. But you can then uh, by much differentiate between the conditions and, and the catalyst material. That's what, what extra re reactions they give in, in addition to the fluoric kinetics, yes? Um, so I think your measurements are very valuable, but they are specific for the situation, for the set of reaction conditions and the matter. Well, that, uh, the, 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 <laughs> but, but uh, <laughs> uh, the CO2 is about as simple a thing as you can do to the system without disturbing it. It's not changing the chemical composition measurably. It is formed, and so, uh, yes, you can argue the propanol addition is not valid. Although, uh, if you look at the products, propanol is a significant product. Uh, at least anything that comes to the gas phase, the label technique is an absolute way to say what happens to anything that gets into the gas phase. You cannot, with the label technique, specifically say that you are forming the same thing on the surface from the label that, and so, uh, it's possible that it's a parallel reaction, but to the extent that it is a parallel reaction, it has to be identical to what something, once it gets in the gas phase or liquid phase, does. So it's not perfect, 
but it's not as bad as that it only applies to one situation at one time, I don't think. I, I just had a, a, a comment about the use of CSDR. Why did you choose a CSDR instead of a low conversion flow flow reactor, which gives you the same uniform composition without the enhancement of secondary reactions that you get because of bad testing in the CSDR? Uh, if I said have time, I would have gone into some of the comparison. Uh, the argument about the two alpha with iron, I think uh, in doing what you're saying in the plug flow reactor at low pressure, uh, we get data that's consistent with a single alpha when you do that. Uh, yes, I realize uh, Exxon has done much. No, no, <coughs> no, no, uh, no and, the and point is that the CSDR is the worst possible reactor to avoid secondary reactions. Um, in one sense, it's the worst, but in another sense, it's the best in that you are able to go to large quantities. Uh, the well, it, it has advantages, it has disadvantages. We have done it both ways, not during the most recent work. We're only running the CSTR. We, we are running plug flow. We're going, we are repeating the ruthenium where we compare it in the plug flow and in the CSTR. So that we will have compared the prior work under similar conditions to what it was done to compare it with CSTR. Yes? Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, thanks very much, Bert, for stimulating. I have one request.